giving script for this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. There will always be some among you who are poor. That is why I am commanding you to share your resources freely with the poor and other and other Israelites in need. Ushers, come forward, please.
the Son. In this chapter, there's a comparison between Jesus Christ and angels. The Son, meaning Jesus, is far greater than the angels. Angels are not on the same plane, power-wise, authority-wise, with Jesus. Not even close. Scripture tells us Jesus is far greater than the angels. Just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. Yep, they're called angels. He's called Savior, Messiah. But I also, also think this refers to angels having names. Like you and I have names. Let's jump down to verse 6. And when he brought his firstborn son into the world, there's a little bit of the Christmas story right here in the book of Hebrews. When he brought his firstborn son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Makes me think of uh, the shepherds, remember? In the fields, and then suddenly a, a, an army of angels just showed up right there, singing glory to God in the highest. Well, I'd have to say they were singing, but the praise for the sense. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. Could that mean maybe that angels are faster than the wind? Could that mean maybe sometimes we can't see them or we don't usually see them just like we can't see the wind? Uh, does that mean that they're like fire or maybe even though you can't see them and they're fast, that like fire, they make their mark after they've done their thing. <coughs> and did you notice in that verse it says, He sends His angels. God gives assignments to angels. Let's drop down to verse 14. Therefore, angels are only servants. They're not to be worshipped. The focus isn't on the angels. And I've known some people in life, maybe you do too, who seem to be over-focused on angels. They're only servants, spirits, sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Again, we see the word sent right here. God is sending them consistently, constantly. Sent to care for people. Who are they to care for? Those who will inherit salvation. God knows before any of us ever accept Jesus Christ, He knows who's going to do that. He knows uh, who's going to have their trust in Christ uh, as just before their body dies. And those people who will inherit salvation, I believe God gives angels to as they're born to look out for them. I think we have personal, our own personal angels. I could take you some scripture on that. But, uh, but also, that other angels, what's it say here? Uh, care for people who will inherit salvation. It doesn't say anything about those who won't inherit salvation, does it? The angels are sent to care for those who have accepted Jesus. They're sent on assignments, we pick up from these scriptures. They are sent. Sent to do what? Well, we know they're sent to praise God. We just read that, didn't we? They're his messengers. In fact, as I look at the original language here, the word for angels and in Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew, uh, seems that the best English word we have to describe angels is messengers. <coughs> they're messengers. They're sent. But they do more than just give a message, a verbal message. They're, they're messengers who also work. They do things. They, they obey what God tells them to do. His messengers are assigned and sent to us, to humans, to do what? To encourage us and to guide us. And then have you ever been down in the dumps and then remembered, oh, I better pray. <laughs> and, and then after prayer have felt lifted and encouraged I think that in scriptures and places it shows angels can just put a touch on people 
And just that touch is able to lift them in, in their minds and in their hearts to give them encouragement. And angels give guidance, too. Uh, have you ever wondered what you were going to do about something and all of a sudden it hits you? Well, yeah, that's what I ought to do. That's what I ought to say. Could it have been an angel was sent and he just gave you the right thing all of a sudden and placed it in your mind? Mm. Angel, angels are also sent to punish God's enemies. Many places that's mentioned in the Bible. Angels, I believe, scripture shows, come in all shapes, all sizes, with different names, like we've, like we've seen here, mentioned their names. And they're gifted. They're not all the same. Some are better at some jobs than others are, just like us. And what would a Christmas story be like without looking at the angels and the part the angels played in the Christmas story? So let's look at that a little bit. Angels in the Christmas story. Starting Luke chapter 1, verse 11. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, Zechariah was John the Baptist's dad. He was a priest, and he took his turn serving in the temple. And he's in, in the holy place, in the temple at this moment, in the sanctuary. And while he was there, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Not an angel serving Satan. He made a point. It's an angel of the Lord who appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar, so Zechariah could see him. So apparently angels can make themselves visible to humans. Verse 12, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. There goes that, oh, angels are so cutesy and they have those baby faces and no, if that had been that kind of an angel, he wouldn't have been scared, would he? He says he was shaken and overwhelmed when he saw the angel. They must be an awesome sight. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. <clears throat> your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Let's go down to verse uh, 18. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. They were beyond babies. And yet, God can do whatever He wants. Now, uh, let's drop down to verse 26. See the angel activity continuing in the Christmas story. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. Down to verse 30. Don't be afraid, Mary. They're always telling people, don't be afraid. You notice that? <clears throat> so I have, I have a sense that if I, if I saw my angel, or an angel, that I'd probably be afraid. Everybody else seems to be. They must be awesome. Not the cutesy five baby doll kind of. That's not how the Bible is it. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. I've done verse 34. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Check out the Christmas story there in Angels. Chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. As he considered this, talking about Joseph, Mary's husband, remember, even though they were legally married, they hadn't slept together yet. That's how the tradition was in those, in those days. They didn't like ours. They were legally married. I hadn't slept together yet. They hadn't been, brought their home together yet. And then they were uh, called to uh, Bethlehem because they had to sign up for taxes. And he noticed she's pregnant. You just can't hide those things forever. And he knows he didn't do it because they haven't got that far along in the marriage tradition of those days. 
He knew he didn't do it. So what's he thinking about? I got an, I want, maybe I should divorce her. That's what he's thinking. And I should divorce her. I'm going to use the word divorce there, proving they were legally married. <clears throat> and as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. In a dream, angels can invade your dreams. They can show up in your dreams. Now, I know as we're looking at angels today, if I were to ask, I could get angel stories from you because people approach me. Every time I bring up angels in a message, people approach me afterwards and they tell me their own angel stories. Hmm. And they can appear in dreams. And I believe angels have been sent to my dreams. And probably some of you would say the same thing. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to keep Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now to verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel, as the angel of the Lord commanded, and kept Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until the son was born. Now, chapter 2 and verse 12. Now, here's the story of the Magi. And they've been taken by the star. The star led them first to the west, and then to Jerusalem. Then the star led them south from there, down to Bethlehem. They saw... Now, this is about a, a year or two after Jesus was born. Remember, the Magi did not show up uh, when, when he was laying in the manger. And they, they saw the young Jesus. And verse 12 says, When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Now, it doesn't mention angels there, but, but what do you think? It says, uh, God warned them in a dream. Now, as we've been reading the, uh, the other scriptures, don't you think it was probably an angel sent there? Now, verse 13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up and flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. All right. Uh, down to verse 19. So they took off, because the angel told them to, took off for Egypt. And when, verse 19, when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up, returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, now who do you think warned him in that dream? Mm. He left for the region of Galilee, so the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. What would a Christmas story be like without angels? Angels were central to what God was doing and how he did it. I've noticed there seems to be a hierarchy of angels. A little bit like an army. You have your privates, your sergeants, your lieutenants, your majors, colonels, and generals. And so therefore some angels have more authority than other angels do. And they're each assigned specific duties. It seems that sometimes God will give one angel a specific responsibility and send him on that assignment. Other times it seems groups of angels are given responsibilities. Uh, for example, I believe that there's an angel that is in charge of our church, our church family here. There's other angels working under him. We have our own angels. That angel is over time this church. I believe there's another angel over top of the new Philly area to which all these other angels are amenable to. 
there's a hierarchy of, of angels. God's going to be organized, isn't he, church? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now this uh, having different duties and responsibilities amongst the angels, I think it's evidenced a little bit in the few who are actually named in the Bible. For example, we were just reading about Gabriel, weren't we? Uh, Gabriel is an archangel. An archangel, that means it's very, a very high ranking angel. Has a lot of authority and therefore probably a lot of power. Now church tradition, this is just tradition. Church tra tradition has it that Gabriel will be the one who will blow the trumpet announcing Jesus' second coming. And I, I tend to lean toward that tradition being true. Because it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that Jesus will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. Now, now Gabriel's been announcing Jesus' coming first time, all along, I think he will the second time too. But that's just tradition. There's another uh, angel named in the Bible, Michael. Michael, we see he brought up in one place is in uh, the book of Daniel. And uh, uh, the time that I'm thinking of and toward the end of the book, Daniel had been praying for Israel and asking forgiveness and for God to restore them so they could go home. They were in exile. And so they could build the temple again and build the wall around Jerusalem. So he was, he was praying to God for his people. And God sent him an angel with an answer to answer Daniel's prayer. And then the scriptures tell us the angel couldn't get Daniel's in Persia at the time. He couldn't get to Daniel in Persia because he was stopped by the powerful prince of Persia. Which would have been a demon. Would have been the head demon over the nation of Persia. And it says, Michael came and helped this angel get through with the message to Daniel by handling this, this uh, angel over Persia, this uh, prince, this demon over Persia. Michael was mentioned there, helping out. Michael, it says there in the last chapter that he, would be, he is the uh, patron angel of, of Israel. In other words, Michael, the archangel, has major the major responsibility for the people of Israel. Interesting. <clears throat> Another angel mentioned by name is just uh, called the angel of the Lord. Now that may be the Lord's own personal angel that's right there carrying the special messages once in a while. And many times though it just means he's an angel of God, angel of the angel of the Lord who's, who's sent on a uh, assignment. Another angel mentioned in the Bible is called Satan. He's the head of all the fallen angels. Scripture tells us one third of the angels rebelled against God and the one who, who took charge, seemed to be most powerful of them all, was Satan. Fallen angels and the Bible calls fallen angels demons, but they're still angels. Another, uh, sometimes they're called uh, unclean spirits. In the gospel stories, we read a lot about demon activity. Now what do we see happening in the gospels? What are these demons, these unclean spirits able to do? Well, we find from those stories that they're able to invade bodies to possess humans. Now that's not to scare anyone that just can't jump into anybody that they want to jump in on. Uh, from my experience and study, people have to be messing with satanic stuff and occult stuff before, in other words, it's almost like people are inviting that kind of act, you know, demon activity in. They just can't go into anyone they want to, and they definitely can't enter into Christians because the Holy Spirit is in. 
Christ say amen. 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 We find in these stories in the Gospels that these demons have their own personalities. Different ones have different personalities. That they can cause mental illness. That does not mean that every mental illness is, is the work of a demon. But they can do that. They can cause physical disease. They can cause deafness. They can cause blindness. And they can cause natural disasters. Remember, not long ago, we had the San Bernardino shooting. Remember that? Out west, California. And uh, Syed Farouk and trying to pronounce this right. Tashfeen Malik, husband and wife, uh, just murdered people. And they planned it. I want to tell you that is demon activity. Demons possessed, planned, used, pushed, deceived them into doing those things. That's demon activity. Um, I just saw an update on a crime that took place some, some time ago uh, of the uh, outcome of the trial, the sentence. And it was concerning the mother who had put her baby in the microwave. You remember that? And she was finally sentenced. What? What could ever move a mom to do something like that? I want to tell you, it's demon activity. They're here at work. We need the awareness of a very real spiritual realm. We need to be aware. We forget that there's a whole other realm right here with us, around us, wherever we go. We get so caught up in the physical, we forget. And this message today is to help us to be aware of the spiritual realm. Scriptures tell us we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. So when our kids were growing up and they got mad at uh, another kid or, or a teacher or a coach or an adult or they get mad at somebody or at each other, we tell them now that person is not your enemy. We're battling against demons. And it's the demons who's deceiving, playing on people's weaknesses and using them to be nasty. And so when we pray in our prayers and spiritual and our in prayer warfare, that's who we're focusing our prayers against. Not against flesh and blood, the scripture tells us. <clears throat> So even though there's all this demon activity, we are told not to fear. You and I do not have to be afraid of demons. And this is evidenced in uh, Luke chapter 10, where Jesus had sent out some of his followers. Chapter 10, um, let's switch here and look up. Remember, he uh, sent 72 of his disciples out in ministry. He gave them an assignment. These are people, though. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Now, they were happy about this. <laughs> they could use, they had the authority to use the name of Jesus to command those demons to quit, to cease and desist. Do you have the authority to use the name of Jesus? You do. Of course, you want to be very prayed up on how you're supposed to use his name, but you do. You have the authority to use the name of Jesus. And we, he already told us who our enemies were, right? We battle not against flesh and blood. <clears throat> you don't have to be afraid of demons.
I was uh, in our in our first church. There was a we had a hubbub. It happens every so often in churches. We're human. We make mistakes. We hurt each other. There's battle for power. That stuff just happens in churches. And we had a hubbub in our in our, in our first church. And uh, DS said, well, let me move you to another church. I said, no, nah, Becca and I have been praying. We believe he wants us right. God wants us right here. And I can remember uh, the, the, you know, when there's a hub up in the church, let me tell you, there's spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's the same thing in a family. When there's, when there's uh, things, when there's troubles in a family, there's spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes. In the workplace, when there's troubles going on, there's spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes. The spiritual realm is real, and there's a lot happening there that affects this physical realm that you and I are in. I remember having a nightmare one night in the midst of this, of this church trouble. And, uh, and I, I just, I just in, in my nightmare, I, I could uh, sense and almost see the demons there uh, trying to oppress me and discourage me and trying to get me to quit on the, and, the, and I woke it up. And I could still, I could just almost see them. Not quite, but almost. I don't know what to, how to explain it. Just that in that, in our bedroom there, Beck was still asleep. I didn't want to wake her up. And in the midst of that, and, and, and they, were, they were just coming at me with wild thoughts and trying to get me out of there. And I said, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone and get out of here. You've got to bow at the name of Jesus. And I wasn't bothered and went back to sleep. <clears throat> we don't have to be afraid. There are many scriptures that give us more insight into angels, what they're about, what they do. I want to hit a few of them very quickly uh, for you. Uh, Matthew 22 and verse 30. Matthew 22, 30 says, For when the dead rise, when's that going to be? The rapture, right? Jesus comes back, and we go up to meet him in the clouds, right? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. So what do we learn here? Angels don't get married. Angels don't have babies. And when we leave this place, we won't either. We won't be married. We won't be making babies. That's Jesus' point right here. I taught this in, in, in my last church. A lady came up afterwards and she says, uh, I don't like that. She says, I want to be married with my husband throughout eternity. I tried to tell her it's going to be better than marriage. You know, that's a whole other teaching. We'll go there another time. It's so much better. Jesus will be your mate, if you will. And the relationships we have with everyone don't think physical. See, that's, what, that's our problem. Uh, so she says, I don't care. I want to be married with him in heaven. And she said, I'm not coming to church here anymore. Uh, she convinced her husband the same and left the scripture offended. She wanted to be married. It doesn't matter what you want. You see, there's truth and how it's going to be, and, and any, that's how it's going to be. Let's take a look at another. So we won't be married or making babies in heaven. Psalm 148. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all the armies of heaven, or hosts of heaven. Next verse. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. I mean, he just, we read the verses between, it mentions... Uh, what all God's created, or a lot of what God's created. You know, the first thing he mentioned was the angels. He's created angels. So they they are not 
wrong. <laughs> that angels are a certain creature and they'll always be angels. Humans are another being and they'll always be human beings. They don't mix. So in the, in, in the what's the Christmas movie uh, with Jimmy Stewart in it? Oh, uh, it's a wonderful life. And Clarence, the angel, remember him in that movie? He was earning his wings because he used to be a human. Trouble is, see, too many people get their theology from the movies and from TV and from books. All right? This is where we get our theology. This is where the truth is. Amen. So, angels were created. They're not all people. They didn't used to be people. <laughs> Certainly the angels. Let's try to... Uh, Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12. It says, Then I looked again and heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels. Just how many angels are there? You ever wonder about that? Are there enough to go around? There's a lot of nasty stuff going on in this earth. Are there enough to be assigned to all these problems in the earth? Uh, the word millions there in, in some translations is myriads. And the word myriads in the original Greek means you can't number them all. Innumerable. That's how many angels there are. Bunches. That's so there are enough out there for the job there for the job. Let's try uh, another scripture. Luke 15, 10. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Uh, one of the fellows who's been working at the Parsonage lately doing some working for the trustees, young guy, and about 10 days ago, uh, he came out to finish another job, and he said to me, he said, uh, I'm a Christian now. So he just recently came to Jesus Christ. And I hugged him and said, hello, brother. And I said, no, I'm rejoicing, but I'm not the only one. I said, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. They rejoice there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So angels get emotional. You think they're just, nope, they get emotional. Just like us. 2 Peter 2.4 For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. I was talking about before the flood. We, if we saw the context. He threw them into, uh, the word there they, they put in this translation is hell, uh, but the Greek word there is tartars. It's the only time this word is used in the whole New Testament. Tartars. I was looking it up again, make sure I got it right. It says, God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into tartars, in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. Read a few different commentaries on that, and and, uh, and most of them agree that, that Tartarus is a place in Hades. Hades is a temporary holding place for souls until judgment. And Tartarus is is the uh, is the deepest, gloomiest place in Hades. Before the flood, there were some demons that were so wicked and so nasty that God was just not willing to let them run over this earth anymore. And so he's been holding them in Tartarus until the angels are judged. And uh, who's going to judge the angels? You are. That's what the Bible says. You are going to judge the fallen angels. These guys here are really nasty. Matthew 25, 41. Then the king, talking about Jesus, will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. The eternal fire is hell. Eternal. You don't get out of hell. There's no back and forth on that place. Once you're in, you're in. And who was it made for? Satan and his demons. Satan and the demons. Wasn't made for humans. God wants all humans to come to Him. Amen. But those who reject Him, they won't receive His salvation, His love. They won't receive Jesus. They will end up in hell.
this good news has been announced to you by those who preach to the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. That's what I, would you pray this for me? That I would preach in the power of heaven. Power of the Holy Spirit. Would you preach for your pastor that way? It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. See, God's plan of salvation is so glorious. And he's worked it out from the creation right on through time, right up to now, and he will right into the future. And the angels are watching it all play out. They see it playing out in individual lives. They see it playing out in nations. They see it playing out on the larger scene over history. And they are excited watching God fulfill his plan of salvation, <coughs> saving sinners for himself. So eagerly, hallelujah. Angels paying attention to what God's doing. Excited about it. Uh, Psalm 91. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. He will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Angels, are, God uses them to protect us. Now here's where you all would give me some stories if I were to ask about, it must have been an angel protecting me. I have a lot of these stories. I can remember uh, back when I was a, a pagan, coming up out of Sio in my Volkswagen. I don't know how fast that's going, fast. But, and as I came up the hill, uh, leaving town toward uh, the west, toward Bowerstown, I hit the knob at the top of the hill and went airborne. I was going fast. And in the air, my, my, my car slowly turned around backwards, and the road turned right Right after the top of the hill, I saw I didn't go over the road. I went over the field. It's real steep and going downhill. And I landed so gently going backwards and just coasted down through that field. Thank God, it was a big field. To the bottom of the hill, nothing was hurt. I wasn't harmed. I'm telling you, that was an angel that did that with me and <laughs> for me. God watching out for me because I will inherit salvation. I had an angel even way back then. They are sent to protect us. <clears throat> we could stay here the rest of the day and get your stories like that, and you would have them, I know. I've heard many of them. Uh, Hebrews 13, too. Now here's an important scripture. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Church, pay attention. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing that. I have a I have my own angel story where I think a couple guys came to my front door one time. I'll save that story for another time <laughs> and give you, you can look up angel stories. Some of us have seen angels and didn't know they were angels. We thought they were people. So angels can be visible and look and act like people. Here's a couple angel stories. Have you ever seen an angel? Dr. S.W. Mitchell thought he had. Dr. Mitchell was a well-known neurologist in Philadelphia. After one very tiring day, he retired early, but he was awakened by a persistent knocking at the door. It was a little girl, poorly dressed and deeply upset. She told him that her mother was very sick and needed his help. Even though it was a bitterly cold, snowy night and he was bone-tired, Mitchell dressed and followed the girl. He found the mother desperately ill with pneumonia. After treating her, Dr. Mitchell complimented the sick woman on her daughter's persistence and courage. The woman gave him a strange look and said, My daughter died a month ago. Her shoes and coat are in the closet there. Dr. Mitchell went to the closet and opened the door. There hung the very coat worn by the little girl who had been at his front door. The coat was warm and dry and could not possibly have been out in the snowy night. Now, wasn't the little girl, that was an angel. Angels can take, they can take all kinds of forms. <clears throat> Another one, have you ever seen an angel? John G. Patton believes he has. While he was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands, hostile natives surrounded his mission headquarters one night. Intent on burning the Pattons out and killing them. Patton and his wife prayed all that night. 
at dawn they were amazed to see the attackers just turn and leave. A year later, the chief of that very tribe was converted to Christianity. Patton then asked him what had kept him and his men from, dern from burning down the house and killing them that night. <coughs> the chief asked Patton a return question. Who were all those men you had with you there? Patton told him there had been no one except his wife and himself. But the chief insisted they had seen hundreds of men standing guard. Big men in shining garments with drawn swords. There's some stories like that in the Bible. Those were angels. When do you think that angels were serving you? Let us not be blinded by the physical realm to the spiritual realm that is around us. God is doing so much more than we can see. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we thank you for the reminder, for the truth, that there's a whole other realm here, right here, and this realm affects us in our lives, and there are angels there who are for us and work with us, who partner with us in our purpose in reaching the lost. Thank you for the reminder, Father God. And this Christmas season, Lord, keep that memory in us. Wherever we go, remember that there are angels out there, good and bad, doing their thing. Thank you for your wonderful creation, Lord. What a mighty God you are. And Father, we... We've also seen those stories in the Bible that talk about people who've seen angels and bowing down to worship the angels. And the angel says, don't do that. Stand up. I'm just a creature of God like you. Worship God, not angels. Praise the glory and worship are yours, Lord God, and yours alone, always. In the name of Jesus, God's kids said, Let's go to the prayer table here this morning. Christmas music, buying gifts left and right, and yet we 
have brothers and sisters we're going to spend eternity with who don't have anything like we have. Who are watching out for their very lives today. And yet, Lord, you can give joy no matter the circumstances. And we're praying you give that to them. That you give them peace no matter what their situation is. Our brothers and sisters, protect their lives. And Lord, keep them strong and bold, courageous to continue to witness others to others around them that Jesus is the Savior. Lord, we lift up uh, the family of Loretta Burton, who has passed, Nita Groff's sister, asking for you to be there, God, and take them through this time in a healthy way. And we ask that Cicely Ventures, kidney stone, would pass, or just cause it to disintegrate now, just to disappear and dissolve. Help her, Lord, and help her quickly. And now, Father, please hear the prayers of my brothers and sisters this morning as they whisper them to you, as they give their burdens unto you now.